بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته What a great pleasure and honor and happiness it is for me to see you again It is a delight for me and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our work and yours Honestly, I am benefiting from you more than what you are benefiting from me. And this experience for me, inshallah, will benefit me a lot going back to the people in Australia. So please don't forget me and us and my colleagues and the Muslims in Australia and around the world, of course, from your dua. Always make dua for our success, inshallah ta'ala, and uh, make your intentions good. Brothers and sisters in Islam. Today's topic, our brothers have chosen the following title, What are your priorities in life? Subhanallah, this question is extremely crucial. What are your priorities in life? Or what is your priority in life? Brothers and sisters in Islam, I would like this evening for you and I to think about this question deeply. Think about it properly. I'll tell you why. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Hold yourself to accountability. Judge yourself before you are ultimately judged, before you are held accountable on the ultimate day. الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم الذي لا ينطق عن الهوى إن هو إلا وحي يوحى he never speaks out of his own desire except that it's an inspiration sent down to him from above said judge yourself before you are judged by who before you are judged by the ultimate judge الله سبحانه وتعالى on the day when he will make us stand whether we like it or not the day when Ibrahim alayhi salam will fall to his knees on the ground and he will say Allahumma sallim, Allahumma sallim O oh Allah, please give us peace, give us peace On that day when every messenger and prophet will run away from the responsibility of having to answer for us and will say I only have myself to worry about On that day you will be judged you will be questioned. You and I will be questioned about every single letter we utter. Yes, I know it is a burdening task. Yes, I know it creates a burden upon us right now. But a person who judges themselves is in a better position than anyone who neglects themselves. Did you not hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran? Nasullaha Nasullah, Nasullah, Fa'ansahum anfusahum, Fa'ansahum anfusahum. They forgot Allah, they neglected Allah, so then Allah made them forget who they are. Allahu Akbar, are you listening to this verse carefully? Allah is speaking about those who forgot Allah's verses. Allah who neglected uh, those who forgot, who neglected Allah their Creator and turned to other things as being their objective. Turned to other things as being the most important thing for them. Turned to other things which they should strive for and reach instead of Allah. Allah says they forgot Allah by being distracted by other things other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them forget who they even are. Made them forget their own identity. Made them forget who you are and what is your purpose. Where are you heading? They forgot Allah, so then Allah made them forget themselves. This is something natural. This is something uh, normal to occur. This is the effect of that. The cause is that we chose to forget Allah, those people, those people who forgot, so the result of that naturally equals a person forgetting who they even are. When you forget who you are, your heart becomes hardened. 
your heart becomes darkened. And when our hearts become darkened, we become unhappy. When we become unhappy, we want to be happy. So when we meet people, what do we do? We act. We act. We put on a show. We become into a state of riya, a form of hypocrisy. Because a person wants to find happiness and they can't. And so they look for other things to bring them happiness. And the first thing they look for is worldly things that can bring them this happiness and this satisfaction. Otherwise they feel that they have no value whatsoever. And this cannot be achieved except with hypocrisy. And there is no truth to it. These types of people lead on. What else? They start to lose their sight, their hearing. They start to lose themselves by going on to intoxications. And a lot of them who we hear about, such as celebrities and the likes of them, whom we on television, we think that they are living the life. But what happens to them? Suddenly we hear about them committing suicide. We hear about them dying of drugs, of alcohol. We find them partying all night until they died. They party to death. These types of people, we think they are living the life. And then we start to imitate them, thinking that this is where happiness comes from. But what's actually happened here to these people, Muslim or non-Muslim? They have forgotten themselves. My brothers and sisters in Islam. My brothers and sisters in Islam. If I want to know whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my priority or not, then the first sign that appears on me is a sign which I only know by myself. No one can know it except me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not my father, not my mother, not my brother or sister, not my friends, not my wife, not my children, only myself. It is when I no longer know who I am. Have you ever felt like that? Inshallah you haven't. But there are many, there are majority of people forget who they are. I'll give you an example. A person says, I am a Christian. I am a Jew. I am a Hindu. Whatever they say they are. If you ask them the question, why are you of that particular religion? The common response is this. Oh, because my parents are. I was brought up that way. Do you think this person knows who they really are? If I say to you, I am a Muslim because my parents are Muslim. Do I know who I am? Do I know why I'm a Muslim? Do I know what I'm meant to be doing? If I knew what I was meant to be doing, do I believe in what I am doing? Or am I doing it to please my parents now? Or am I doing it to please my culture? Or my people that are looking at me? Or the members in the masjid who see me going there? Or am I doing it to just put on a show to my family? The first sign of this hypocrisy is that when I'm alone, I have a different identity. When I am alone, I watch things which I don't watch in the day. When I am alone, I listen to things people don't know that I listen to. When I am alone, I am happy that no one is watching me because the first thing I want to do is to resort to the things which Allah hates. This is one of the other signs of a person who does not know who they are. Or they think they are something, but they are not putting on the show. So when you ask a person, why are you a Muslim? I wonder how many people can give a proper answer. Why have you grown your beard? Why do you wear hijab? Why do you pray? I wonder what kind of answers we get. On the outside, we can all find what we call politically correct answers. Answers that are the proper answers should be said. But who am I really? Do I fit the description which I am putting? When Allah says, they forgot Allah, Allah made them forget themselves. I no longer know who I am. On the outside, I look like something, but on the inside, I'm completely something else. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Listen to what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Here is just an example of how a person knows who they are. He says, مَنْ تَرَكَ النَّظْرَةَ لِلَّهِ عَوَّضَهُ اللَّهُ عَوَّضَهُ اللَّهُ حَلَاوَةً مِّنَ الْإِيمَانِ يَجِدْهَا فِي قَلْبِهِ Whoever, for example, 
abandons looking at something which is forbidden, Allah will expiate that or will compensate that with a sweetness of the feeling of Iman which they find it inside of their heart. The point of that hadith which I wanted to allude to is not the fact that a person uh, stopped looking at haram. This is only one thing. What I'm trying to say is, when a person stops any act which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates, it means that that person is only wanting the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in how they use their eyes, for example, or how they use their body, how they use their time. And as a result, the genuine, the genuine, the, the sign of you being genuine in that, meaning that Allah is your objective by abstaining from this, by controlling yourself, the sign of this genuine love for Allah, making Him your priority, is that you will find a feeling of sweetness inside of your heart. This sweetness, wallahi, if you give this person everything in the world, if you give them everything that any human desire would want, it will not make a difference in their sweetness that they feel inside their hearts. Are you like me? When was the last time you felt the sweetness of Iman? Was it last night? Is it now? Or was it a year ago? Ten years ago? When you were a child? When was the last time I felt this deep sweetness of Iman? Where in the night I felt like waking up when everybody else was asleep and I just felt this drive to make me stand alone in the dark with a tiny candle or a tiny light. I don't want anyone to see me. I don't care if anyone sees me or knows what I am doing. I just have this sweetness, this love to get up and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak to Him because I love Him. I feel the sweetness that doesn't leave my heart. It makes me give up my sleep because the sweetness of what I am doing is more beloved to me than my sleep. When was the last time you or I felt this particular sweetness? Then not only that, as I was praying in the night, I don't know why, but I felt that my heart began to pound in such a way I've never felt before. It's not the pounding of a person with a heart attack. It's not the pounding of a person who has been exercising for so long. It's not the pounding of a person with a sickness, but the pounding of something called a sweetness that has affected my eyes to water and now I'm crying. And I don't know why. The only thing I can say is there is a sweetness inside me that makes my tears flow out of consciousness and love and communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When was the last time you felt like that? I'll tell you when. It was the time when you felt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is truly your only objective in your whole entire life. I'll give you an example of people who are far away from Allah when they feel this sweetness. Do you want to know where? I am going to talk about a kafir, a disbeliever, a fighter of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A random disbeliever who knows the truth of Allah and rejects him directly, I'm going to tell you at a time when he or she can find the sweetness and closeness to Allah, where no other priority exists but the priority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll tell you, it is mentioned in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in one way, one way of the, the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, because there are many verses about this. Allah speaks about disbelievers in the middle of the ocean on a ship. Suddenly the waves begin to hit this ark. And suddenly the ship begins to sink. And the person who is on there is a disbeliever. How do I know? By the way the verses end in the end. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا غَشِيَهُمْ مَوْجٌ كَالظُّلَلِ دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ لَئِنْ أَنْجَيْتَنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Oh Allah, if you were, he says, and when the waves begin to rise above them, in another verse, كَالظُّلَلْ Like clouds that are covering them and the waves begin to hit them and in another verse it says, they have no hope except Allah. 
and there is no way to escape it and they know that they are going to die they are going to sink they are going to drown and nothing can help them Allah says suddenly they turn to Allah and they call upon him with sincerity fully from their heart oh Allah if you were to save us you we will be among the believers we will be among those who will please you we will be among those who will be the first to do good work Allah says in the Quran but when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves them to land, to security, to safety, where they feel that they are now safe, Allah says, some of them, they begin to betray their promise. They begin to uh, mix their intentions. They begin to try to forget what they promised before when they're about to die. Allah says in the Quran, and nobody denies our signs except a person who is khattal. Khattal means a betrayer. One who gives promise and deliberately betrays it. Khattal. I'll give you a promise if you save me, I will do this for you. But when I save you, you betray me. Khattal. Kafur. Kafur means, the meaning of kafur literally means to neglect or deny or hide the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the truth. This is the reality. So now the objective that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes ours is really when? When our lives are at stake, do we, do, do we really want to be like a person who is a disbeliever in Allah? That the only time we make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our priority is when we have nothing else to look forward to? When everything is taken away from us, is it only then that we look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or do we look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He has given us everything? When we look around us and we notice that Alhamdulillah, I'm fine whether I have it or don't have it. At the end of the day, my priority is the hereafter. My priority is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from us? Let us begin with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is in muttafaq alayhi in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari. An Amir al Mu'mineen Umar ibn al Khattab. He said, Abi Hafsin, Umar ibn Khattab said that the Prophet sallallahu said, إنما الأعمال بالنيات إنما الأعمال بالنيات As a matter of fact, إنما literally means as a matter of fact, meaning whatever you thought, neglect it, forget about it. As a matter of fact, the truth is, all actions are judged by your intentions. All actions are judged by the intentions. It starts here. Whether you do a good act or a bad act, it comes down to the intention. I know there are correct acts and wrong acts. And I know that the condition of an act to be accepted, you have to have two things. And they are proper intention, and correctness of the action. But let's say this person is ignorant of the correct action, doesn't know, and tries their best with the faculties which Allah had given them, and with the best of their knowledge, then what really matters at that space, at that time? The intention. And for every person they will receive only in accordance with what they intended. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So whoever, for example, Allah Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given us an example of a scenario. He says, so whoever, for example, they wanted to migrate for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, their objective is for Allah and His Messenger. For example, they are migrating in order to practice their deen better somewhere else or to learn their deen better somewhere else or they are escaping uh, uh, disbelief or oppression of religion to find a place where they can practice it properly. They are migrating for Allah and His Messenger. 
or to take part in a charitable work, or to go and help some orphans, or to go for whatever reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, is a migration for Allah and His Messenger, then their migration is for Allah and His Messenger. That's what they will receive. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ امْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ But whoever, for example, wants to migrate, giving the example of migration of Rasulullah as one of the many examples, in order to earn something of this dunya. He wants to migrate because of business or because of work. Some of you have migrated from other places to Qatar in order to work. You have a job, you have a contract. That's okay. But if that is the intention, then you will receive that which you intended for. Or to go and get married, for example. Some people, they migrate to get married to someone, to a woman, and to live there, and to build a family. Then their migration is based on the intention for which they migrated for. For which they migrated. Brothers and sisters, what is this hadith telling us? It is telling us that everyone will receive that which they originally intended for. And it is nothing wrong with seeking dunya, seeking a woman to marry or a man to marry, seeking some type of business, seeking some type of something that is involved with the world. There is nothing wrong with that. Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ لِعِبَادِهِ الْمُتَّقِينَ Say, who is it that forbids that you earn luxury or entertainment or enjoyment from this world, the beauty of this world, for those who fear their Lord? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forbid you from enjoying things of this world, from having wealth, from having a nice home, from having a luxurious car, from having nice clothing and so on and so forth. Allah does not forbid that. But look at the condition, لِعِبَادِهِ الْمُتَّقِينَ أو لِعِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ For those who believe, for those who are pious, for those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the only condition. That whatever worldly belonging you have, whatever worldly objective you want to go for, then be careful. Choose only the halal means. That's the only condition. Fear Allah in what you do for your worldly gain. But at the end of it, you receive that which you intended for. However, the ultimate objective for a person should be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to abstain from the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. This is the ultimate goal for a believer. The question, what is your priority? If everything is based on intention, then guess what? The outside appearance becomes insignificant if the intention is incorrect. Now ask yourself the question, why do you grow your beard? Why do you wear a thawb? Why do you pray in the masjid? Why do you take part in charitable events? Why do you take part in organizing lectures? Why do you come to the lectures? Why do you wear the hijab, sister? Why do you do what you do of the things which normally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves? I am not judging anyone, brothers and sisters. Wallah. I am just trying to reach into the hearts and help myself and yourself to judge yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges us. I want on the day of judgment that you don't hold me accountable and I don't hold you accountable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reminds us constantly of the hereafter. And He reminds us of the good and the bad of it. Only because He cares for us. He wants us to prepare. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulallah, mata sa'ah? O Messenger of Allah, when is the last hour going to come? What do you think Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied? Did he tell him on this day, in this month, when this happens, when that happens? No! Al Rasul Sallam asked him a question as an answer. His answer was in the form of a question. The man said, Mata sa'a ya Rasulullah? When is the last hour going to come? When is the world going to end? Al Rasul Sallam answered him by asking, Mada a'adatta laha? Three words. Allahu Akbar. Simple words that they mean so much. They are the answer to everything. What have you prepared for? What have you prepared for? ماذا أعددت له? 
The man is asking when the world's going to end, and the Rasul is telling him, What have you prepared for it? You see, I don't think the man was going to live for very long to see when the world's going to end, to prepare for it. So I wonder why the Prophet is asking him the question, What have you prepared for it? as though he is telling him that you're going to live till that end. What the Rasul is saying is that there are two meanings for the end. One, the end of the universe, and two, every single individual has an appointed time to die. What have you prepared for your death, for the meeting of your Lord? Now, brothers and sisters in Islam, if a person lives life with death in mind, meaning with the hereafter in mind, what will they ultimately be working for then? They will be working for something which is everlasting, not something which is temporary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of this world in a temporary language. He says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ And this world, this hayat al-dunya, this life of this dunya, the life of this dunya, dunya comes from the root word dana'a or daniya, which means low life, not worth anything, insignificant. The life of this insignificant world is nothing but two things. Mata' and ghurur. Mata' means temporary enjoyment. Ghurur, deception. So the entertainment is temporary, and not only is it temporary, it's also deceiving. It's not even real. So you know when we hear it, when we talk about the hereafter, to us now it seems like a dream, a fantasy, something which is, uh, we don't get affected by it because it's not right now. But Allah is telling us it's actually the opposite. You're going to feel in the hereafter, that this world that you actually saw as reality, this was the fantasy. This was the imaginary world. This was the thing which was, was just a, a dream. And truly, it will be like that. Allah says in the Quran that when the people are gathered on the day of judgment, before the judgment begins, the people, everyone, Muslim, non-Muslim, everyone, the prophets are among us, the shuhada are among us, the ulama are among us, the good and the bad, everybody, they will ask one question. Among the first questions that they will ask after مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا هَذَا Who has brought us back to life after our slumber? The other question that people ask commonly is كَمْ لَبِثْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ عَدَدَ سِنِينَ Oh people, come here. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? This is what the verse is saying. Yani, the, the language, it's a rhetorical language. Oh people, are you thinking what I'm thinking like that in that manner? How long, how many years do you think we actually stayed on earth? Can anyone count the years? As though the person is saying, I don't feel like it was a lot. Let me ask the people. Allah says the people give a reply. Everyone gives a reply to others. They will say, إِلَّا يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمًا Wallahi, we don't feel except that as if we lived for a day or part of a day. لا إله إلا الله فاسألوا العادين طيب, let's ask those who have a better ability of calculating. That's what people say on the Day of Judgment. Let's ask those who are better in calculating. فاسألوا العادين So they go and we, we ask them. And the عادين, the better calculators say إِلَّا بِثْتُمْ إِلَّا يَوْمًا Allahi, your whole life was probably not only more than a day. Who, is, who, who are they addressing? One life or two lives? Me or you? No. Are they talking about that 60, 70 or 100 years? No. He's talking about from the beginning of humanity to the end of time. This whole world from the beginning of the jinn and the humans to the end of the jinn and the humans will be felt on the day of judgment as if it was a day or part of a day.
لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. And that is when the people begin to regret and say, "This is what I complained about. A day or part of a day. This is which I have wasted. A day or a part of a day. This temporary time is why I was worried. I was complaining how many prayers I have to pray." This was the time which I gathered and hoarded and built up all my wealth and my money and I forgot about sadaqah and zakat and the rights of others for a day or part of a day. You know, this is the, the whole universe. What about my 60 or 70 or 100 years of my life? It is a speck inside of a speck. For a speck, I neglected my salah. For a speck, I oppressed my family. I oppressed people of other nationality to me. I oppressed my worker. I oppressed my relative. For a speck of a speck of a time, I complained about a sickness I had and, and I, I blamed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for my suffering. For a speck of a speck of a time, Allahu Akbar, I wasted my time and sold my hereafter for this world. Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَئِذِ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانِ وَأَنَّا لَهُ الذِّكْرَى On that day man will remember. يَتَذَكَّر They will reflect, they will remember, they will ponder, they will understand, and they will come to a conclusion which is definite. But Allah says, وَأَنَّا لَهُ الذِّكْرَى but what would all of this benefit him or her on that day? On that day, man will realize that they have mixed their priorities. The everlasting for the temporary. So the question, what is your priority? Judge yourself before you are judged. On the day of judgment, In Sahih Muslim and similar in Tirmidhi, three people will be brought. A scholar, a alim, a charitable giver, mutasaddiq, and a shaheed, a martyr, a person who died in the cause of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge the alim. He will ask him, I gave you knowledge. How did you use this knowledge? The alim will reply, Rabbi, my Lord, I taught this knowledge seeking your pleasure. Allah will say, You are lying. And when the angels hear this, they reply, you are lying. The angels say it because they know that whatever Allah says is the ultimate truth. Allah will then say, You only taught this knowledge so that people can praise you and say, MashaAllah, what a knowledgeable alim. Let us put him in the front rows. Let us favor him by honoring him first. Let us give him food before others. Let us put him in our expensive cars. Let us give him from ourselves everything. Let us call him this and honor him in that way. And this is what you did it for. You have received what you intended for. You have received what you intended for. Allahu Akbar, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. A alim who thousands, even millions of people in the world started to pray because of him knew how to pay their zakat because of him, gave da'wah because of him or her. People have saved themselves from hellfire because of this alim, what they taught them. He will be called a liar because of something that was inside, which only Allah knew. A alim can be like that. Even an alim can be that. Allah does say in the Qur'an, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ it's a possibility that some people will be brought on the day of judgment and they have done so much work 
more than anyone. And then we will make it as if it was haba and manthura, just dust in the wind. We ask Allah to save us from this. Then the mutasaddiq will be brought. The one who gave charity, wealthy, 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 rich in money. What did you do with the wealth that I gave you? The rizq. And he will say, Rabbi, I gave it in charity to benefit the people. I gave it to the poor and I gave it to the needy and I gave it to the orphans and the widows and I gave it to the family that was in need and I gave it into an event which taught people and I gave it to educational institutions and I gave it to the printing company to print Qur'ans for da'wah and I gave it and I gave it to... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, why did you do that? He says, I gave it in order to please you, Ya Allah. Allah will say, Bal kathabt. You are lying. And the angels will reply, you are lying! Brothers and sisters, let me hold for a minute over here. I want you to imagine this mashhad, this scenario, this event, when Allah is saying to this person, Is there anyone where the ultimate judgment can be final then with the finality being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah says, you are lying. The angels then reply, like it's an echo. You know when you hear the echo? Can you imagine some, some people, they put people through torture. Some oppressors, they want to torture you. They put you into this room and they start playing these scenes or these noises. One of the forms of torture, psychological torture, to destroy your whole life, your mind. They put these things that repeat in your ear over and over and over and over and over until you lose yourself. You become, psych you, you, you become psychologically destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Dave Judgment will say, you are lying. And then the angels will repeat again and again and again until this person cannot bear the sound. There are more angels than what you can count the amount of atoms on earth. Allahu A'lam. Why? Rasul sallallahu was walking and he heard the, a crackling sound and the companions felt that the earth was shaking and Rasul sallallahu said Allahu Akbar the sky has crackled and truly truly it has crackled for a justified reason there isn't a single span of a palm span of distance in all the skies the heavens except that there is an angel Standing to Allah, bowing to Allah, making sujood to Allah. Mawdi'u shibrin. And Rasul Sallallahu said, the first guy compared to the second is like a ring thrown into the desert. And the second to the third like a ring thrown into the desert. The third to the fourth like a ring thrown into the desert. Until the seventh. And every palm's link is an angel there. On the day of judgment, this amount of angels without one of them being silent will say, you are lying. And then Allah will say, You donated this wealth which I gave you in order for people to call you a charitable person. And so your name can last after your death as being a charitable person, a generous man. And because you intended that, you have received it. Today you have nothing with us. Then the shaheed will be brought. This is the person who gave his life or her life away. Allah will ask that person, what did you do with the body I gave you? And he or she will say, I fought in your cause. I died in your cause. I stood up for the truth in your cause against the, oppress the oppressive ones. And so I am a shaheed. Allah will say, you are lying. And the angels will repeat, echoing, you are lying. Allah will say, you only did that so that people can call you a hero and build monuments out of you. And you have received that which you intended for. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking to Mu'adh radiyallahu anhu in this hadith. He was sitting in front of him. And he grabbed Mu'adh's knee. 
and shook it. Like something, he wanted him to pay extra attention. Something very serious. Ya Muhad! These are the first three people with whom Allah shall ignite hellfire with. والعياذ بالله نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى السلامة والعافية آمين أعالم المتصدق الشهيد the first people in hellfire shall ignited with الله أكبر why just because of a secret which existed inside of them it was their heart their objective their priority their intention was something of this world rather than Allah why did I mention this hadith a lot of people assume that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be our priority, it means that a person should just pray and fast and do all these actions of worship and that will ensure you a place in Jannah. But on the outside appearance is one thing. And if the heart and the intention are in line, then all of this work means nothing. And there are people who assume that you should not make worldly things your priority, Meaning, meaning, they should not earn any wealth, they should not have a nice car, they should not wear nice clothing, they should not enjoy life at all. Because they think that if you do so, then Allah is no longer your priority. False, wrong. Who said that a mu'min, a believer, a prophet, cannot laugh a little bit, cannot enjoy life a little bit? A Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once said, Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbu al-jamal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful He likes his servants to be beautiful To look beautiful To enjoy beautiful things A man, this is in reply to a man who said Ya Rasulullah, some of us like to wear nice shoes Nice clothing Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said Allah is beautiful, he likes beauty There's nothing wrong with that They used to sit around after Fajr and the companions would talk about things that made a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smile and they would laugh about it, entertaining themselves about worldly things, but in a halal way. They used to enjoy conversations, they used to entertain each other. Imam ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, you all know about Imam ibn al-Qayyim? Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziya rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, one of the things I learned about living this life as a mu'min is that I was sitting under a tree one time writing. Because Imam al used to write a lot, mashallah. His writing is beautiful. And yani people used to say, we used to love reading Imam al qayyims material more than what we liked listening. And for Ibn Taymiyyah, we used to love listening to him more than what we liked reading. So Imam al qayyim was very poetic in his words. He said, I was sitting under a tree, and this is the form poem he's saying, and I saw these two men carrying a log. What were they carrying? A log. And this log was heavy. One man on one side, the other one on the other side. And they were trying to transport this log to another place. Because it was so heavy and, rig and he could see that they were sweating and it was hot. He found that they were saying poetry to one another. One of them would say a line of poetry and end it with a letter. Then the other person had to start another line of poetry with the same letter he ended. So they were playing a game. A game. And they were entertaining themselves. Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi said, I learned a lesson over here. The way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he is your priority does not necessarily mean that you avoid and abandon entertaining things of this world. But rather, embrace the entertaining things of this world for, with the right intention. And make it a halal way. A way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. There's nothing wrong with saying poetry and playing a game with ending letters. In order for them to forget about their pain, which they were going through and forget about the heat which they were in they were uh, going through in order to help them finish their work to move the lot from one place to another and still feel satisfied and happy similarly is the case of our deen if your priority is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then one of the means that help you is to work for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an entertaining form nothing wrong with that a Rasul Sallallahu once sat trying to teach a man about how, how many rak'ahs are in each prayer and how many prayers they are. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would repeat, Fajr is two prayers, Dhuhr is four rak'ahs, you know, Asr is four, Maghrib is three, Isha is four. And he tried to explain the sunnahs that are watib for them. And the man could not memorize them, subhanAllah, he had a bad memory. So a companion entered 
and he found that Prophet ﷺ was struggling, really, in trying to take this man to memorize the amount of raka'at and so on. So the man said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me, can I try? So he sat with him, and he made what the Prophet ﷺ said in the form of poem, in the form of a poem, it rhymed. And the man memorized it, teaching the deen in an entertaining fashion. You are enjoying it, you're having a laugh, at the same time, you're making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your priority. Why are you doing it? You're doing it to make the deen easier for the people, to bring the deen to the people. And some people they say, why should I drive to the masjid? Walk to the masjid. Like, yeah, it's dhuhr. It's 40 degrees. Still walk? Yes, because for every step that you take, there are 10 hasanat puran, a hasanat puran and a say are taken off. Or 10 hasanat puran and 10 off. So you should walk. If, even if it means I'm going to probably uh, not make it there because of the heat, yes. No. Your priority is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it means that, go in your car and go there. Make deen easy for you to practice. Don't make it hard upon you to practice. Less is more sometimes, so long as your intentions are good. So if your priority is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger, then you will be a person who enjoys worship, not one who makes it hard. At the same time, my brothers and sisters in Islam, some people do good work with the wrong intention, and some people do bad work for the wrong intention. Yani for example, there are people who like to look a particular form. They want to look like uh, some celebrity. They want to imitate some kind of act which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger don't like. Why? Because their intention is in order to look cool. Their intention is in order to receive praise from their friends and their colleagues. They're of a particular form, their identity is one at home, and then when they see their friends and they see their colleagues, their identity suddenly changes. Why? Because their intention is in order to please people. These two people, those who are working for the acts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, and those who are doing acts which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. What is the common thing between them that makes them both وَالْعِيَادُ بِاللَّهِ أَنْتَ hellfire And their actions not, not serve them? I'll tell you what it is. It is the wrong intentions. The person who does the wrong act suffers in two ways. The wrong intention and the wrong act. The person who does the good suffers also in two, in two ways. They strive and struggle to do, do, do the good act and it is not accepted and their intent, because their intention is wrong. So two things. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our priority means that whatever you do in life, do it in a halal way. If it's entertaining, alhamdulillah, do it. If it is not an entertaining thing, then still strive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it. And avoid the haram as much as you can. That will mean that everything you do in your life can be transformed into an action by which you have prioritized Allah. How? Let me give you a few examples. We all know that if you open up the Quran and read, MashaAllah, you are doing an act, on the outside at least, that prioritizes Allah's pleasure. Isn't that correct? You fast Ramadan, on the outside, you look like a person who is doing an act that prioritizes the pleasure of Allah. If you have the proper intention, Alhamdulillah, you are prioritizing Allah. Everybody understands that if you go to Hajj, or you pray, or you grow your beard, or you wear your hijab, or you uh, donate, or whatever you do, it is an act which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been prioritized with. You leave your work to pray your salah. You take half of your lunch break in order to do your Jumu'ah. So you've sacrificed things for the sake of Allah. Excellent, excellent. But this is the obvious way of making Allah your priority. I will give you some other ways that are not so obvious. And inshallah, to make every single person here in this room and everyone around the world, whether you are knowledgeable or not knowledgeable, whether you are, whether you are capable of donating like a wealthy person or incapable of doing that, whether you are able to go to the masjid or not able to go to the masjid, whether you have these luxuries or not. There are a thousand other ways where you prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the normal actions that you practice in your day. How? 
Did you not hear the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Where he said, when you enter the toilet, enter it with your, which foot? Left foot. Is there anyone here who is not able to do that? Unless you don't have a left foot. Or you're paralyzed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure those who are in that situation and reward them for their patience. You enter with your left foot. Al Rasul Sallallahu Sunnah is that you don't talk in, inside of the toilet. Why? Out of respect for the angels who write. They don't like entering places which human beings find undesirable. So then after that, you exit the toilet with your, with your what? Your right foot. Is anyone here unable who has two legs to walk out with their right foot? Everybody is able to do that. And then you say something very simple. You either say, Oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness. Yeah, and he may be inside the toilet. Maybe a person uh, recited the Quran in their mind. Or maybe they said words of dhikr in their mind. You know, or maybe accidentally they would have said their normal dhikr words silently upon their tongue or something like that. So they say, Oh Allah, forgive me if I've made any mistake. Or you can say, Alhamdulillah, Praise be to Allah who has taken away this harm away from me and saved me from any sickness. By doing these four simple acts, yes, four simple acts, you have suddenly transformed a very natural part of a human need, whether you are Muslim or not, into an act of worship. You have turned it into an act of worship that is like, similar to praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reading the Quran, fasting, donating, just by merely with the intention of adhering to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have prioritized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Continue with your work. Continue with what you're doing. But in your intentions, who is your priority? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One brother sat with me one time. He thought that he was very educated. MashaAllah. He's got a doctorate and said to me, which is nothing wrong. Muslims should be educated in all areas, inshaAllah, except the haram areas. Unless you are going to learn the haram area in order to, what? To know ways of how to stop it. Masalan, a person learns about how people practice sorcery in order to what? To save themselves from these types of people or in order to stop these sorcerers, for example, if they have that power to do so. But when a person, this person sat with me and said, what is this idea of saying ghufranak when you exit the toilet? What have I done wrong? I've only went and done something which every human is a need, has a need to do. And I've exited the toilet and I have to ask Allah to forgive me? Where's the sense in that? I say to him, طيب أخي الكريم, Have you not considered at least that you are practicing a sunnah which the Prophet ﷺ used to do? Intending for the, re the rewards at least? I mean, is everything that we do just purely, if I don't get a gain from it, Directly, then I don't have to, I, I shouldn't do it. Why don't you think of it this way? That if you do something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger loved, you are automatically getting rewarded only for the mere fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger loved it. So, when you prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, I'll give you an example. I asked, uh, back in Australia, I asked a sister who had converted to Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from her and all of those who, mashaAllah, have changed their life and transformed it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This sister put on the hijab, proper hijab, not uh, trousers and a little headscarf or something like that. This is a trend back in the West now. Uh, they wear uh, pants and the scarf. Okay, akhi, hijab is not a scarf. A scarf is just something, but even men wear it. You've seen the Khalijis and the Qataris, they wear it. This is called a khimar in the Arabic language. In the Quran, a khimar, khimar. Men wear it too. The only difference is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, tell the women, Let the women, however, use their khimar to draw it over the jayb. Jayb is the opening of any shirt or thing that you wear above. So what, how, however big the opening is, they have to draw it over uh, and also the chest area and the back. So, hijab. I asked them, may I ask you a question? Why did you wear the hijab? These converts who come into Islam, why did they wear the hijab? I mean, uh, we've always given da'wah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tried to explain the reason and the wisdom behind hijab and often we fail. It's not easy to explain the hijab to non-Muslims. Not easy at all. Very, very difficult. 
So why did they put on the hijab? They became Muslim because of the truth of Islam. They found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believed in the hereafter, believed in the Qur'an, and look, suddenly she found the verse in the Qur'an which tells her to wear the hijab. She says, Allah said this? Yes, Allah said this. That's all I need to know. The faith that increased, the priority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recommends or commands, and whatever He prohibits or dislikes, a person automatically either does it or doesn't do it, just for the mere fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their objective. Brothers and sisters in Islam, what is your priority in life? Are you doing it for worldly gain? Or are you doing it to gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter? Sit down tonight, alone, with no distractions. And ask yourself, today I attended this lecture. Why did I attend it? What am I now going to do about it? Today I gave in sadaqah. Why did I do it? What do I want to gain out of it? Today I joined as a part of this good work with a group of brothers or sisters. Why did I do it? And what do I want to gain out of it? Ask yourself all these questions and come to a sincere and honest conclusion with yourself. Have I truly intended well? If I intended well, let me test myself. Did I show the signs? Meaning, if I helped out in this particular good work, was I among the first to be there? Was I among the first to exert my energy for it? Or was I there only to be seen? Was I there only so that my name can be mentioned later on? Was I there so that people can come up to me and say, Assalamu alaikum, masha'Allah. Did I do it for that reason? My brothers and sisters in Islam, when I practice a particular action, did I do it because of tradition first? or because of Islam first. I know, customs and traditions are important in Islam. Very important. In fact, in our Sharia, there are five principles in coming to a conclusive uh, ruling in fiqh. And one of these principles is al-urfu muhakkam, that customs can be used in a court of law. Customs can be used in making rulings in Sharia but not before a clear, a clear ruling from Allah or His Messenger is there. So when there are clear rulings from Allah and His Messenger, and there is tradition and custom, which one do I put before the other? I'll give you a few examples. As a marriage celebrant, I'm a marriage celebrant in Australia, I found out many different cultures in how they perform their marriages. And subhanAllah, some of them were pleasing, but others of them, wallahi, caused us so much heartache, heartache, which caused a lot of youth to not want to get married and resort to haram means or to difficult means, which caused the parents to fall into predicaments. Tradition and culture, for example, in my culture, the Arab culture, so that I don't attack anyone here of a different culture, subhanAllah. In my culture, the Arab culture, the Lebanese culture, when you want to get married, you have to talk about the mahr, this is Islamic, the mahr, the dowry, as loosely translated. And it is a custom and tradition in certain parts of Lebanon that it has to be more than a hundred thousand dollars. Mahr of a hundred thousand to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And you know what they say to you? They say to you, don't worry, don't worry, it's just ink on paper. You know what ink on paper means? Hibr ala waraq. Meaning, it's, it's, we're not, we don't really mean it. Allahu Akbar. And then you reply and you know that on the Day of Judgment, Allah will ask you about this mahab. Because Allah says, nihla. Give your wives the sadaq. The sadaq is the mahar which you promised them. Nihla. From, you know, out of satisfaction, out of clear-heartedness. And don't take any of it. 
You come and tell them this, they say, no, 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 it's just ink on paper. And then, uh, God forbid, when a divorce happens or a separation happens, what happens? The parents come in and they say, we want every cent. What happens to this person? Culture takes over and this person no longer wants to get married. How can they get married and afford to get married? So what do they resort to? Their daughters, their sons, eloping, running off. Why make the mahar so big? Because of culture and the stresses of tradition. What will people think? My daughter went cheap. Allah, Allah. So now you're selling your daughter? One brother said to me, uh, he went to Lebanon to get married. I can speak about my own kind a little bit. Went to get married. Brother said to him, $50,000, knowing that he's from Australia. He said, You're selling me a, a cattle, a cow or something? What's this? This is a trade of livestock? Your daughter is worth more than that. But do you have to put a price to her? This tradition. Another thing. When you get engaged, you have to chuck this huge party. You know, engagement, engagement. Before marriage, the nikah hasn't even been done. So then they say, okay, now I want to officially engage you to my daughter. We have to invite the relatives and we have to invite this person and that person and that person. So how much money are you going to spend on this celebration? You have to hire this hall out and you have to buy this thing. And she has to wear a semi-wedding dress. Allahu Akbar. The brother is not even halfway, he's not even married. It's just a question. Can I marry your daughter inshallah in the future and see how things go? And automatically he's already paid what the amount of what it will cost to actually get married. So the brother ends up poor and then says, Subhanallah, you know, look, uh, we can't get married right now. Tayyib, why? I've spent all my money on your engagement. We have to now postpone it till about a year. I have to work harder and I have to now work double jobs. I'm sorry I can't talk to you. I can't get to know you anymore because this was the intention. Because now I have to go to work. Night shift and day shift. Then the parent says, Ya Akhi, it's been one year. You know, tradition says that you're not allowed to be with her alone. Let's do the Kat Biktab, the Nikah contract. So they come to do the Kat Biktab. Ah! But when you do the Kat Biktab, you are not allowed to go out alone. You're not allowed to hold each other's hands. What will people think? Okay, Akhi, you've married her. No, 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 no. We're only doing this to help you because people will start talking, you're coming in and out, in and out all the time. This is Aib. So now look how difficult marriage has become. And then they want to cut off the marriage. Bring the mahar. I thought it was ink on paper. Every cent. She's my daughter. You think she'll go cheap like that? Just come and go? So what happens? They don't want to get married anymore. We have now in the West this idea of de facto relationships and partnerships. No longer husband and wife. Even in our own Muslim communities. Why? Because they prioritize tradition and culture and customs more than Islam itself. One brother, I said to him, when you do an engagement, it's just a promise to marry. Yani you come in secret and you ask the brother, Father, yani, inshallah, can I get to know your daughter? He says, well, you know, you look like a nice person, genuine person. Bring your father here. They talk a little bit and they say, okay, you know, you've got a few weeks, inshallah, that can come and get to know us and we get to know you. No one else can ask for her. That's it. That's all it is. Yani the next day, a person can pick up the phone and say, ya akhi, look, I, I, we thought of not going ahead. Okay, easy. No strings attached. Everybody goes their own way. Simple, simple, simple. One brother, and he, he got engaged, and uh, a promise was made for marriage. Alhamdulillah. One day it didn't work out, and I just walked away. Alhamdulillah. Simple. So I said to this brother, look, you have to, you know, now that you're engaged, they, had, they invited me to this engagement, and we had this little celebration. And uh, they said, okay, now we have to recite Al-Fatiha to officially conclude that this engagement is official. I said, Akhi, let's make a dua, inshallah. He goes, La, you have to recite Al-Fatiha. Now, there's nothing wrong with Al-Fatiha. So I explained to them, look, Al-Fatiha is a good uh, idea and everything like that. But yeah, and it doesn't have to be, have to be, have to be. He says, no, it has to be by tradition and culture. And I wish that he would have said, let's please Allah by reciting Al-Fatiha. This brother doesn't even pray. He says to me, you have to say Al-Fatiha. After explaining, alhamdulillah, they were convinced. They brought out the sweet. It's also part of tradition. And the brother said, Ya, Shuhad, what's this? You brought out the sweet before reciting Al-Fatiha? This is abominable. And made a huge thing. So the, the brother was my cousin who was getting engaged. He got upset with me. The next day he said, Ya Akhi, I invited you and look what you did to me. 
So what did I do? La hawla wa laqa. Wallah, ya khay, I'm sorry. Is that like, ya khay, tell him to recite al-Fatiha, please. Now that they're thinking of whether I should take their daughter or not, because they think we're extreme. <laughs> so I had to go up and say, Akhi, Wallah, I'm not extreme. I'm the last person to be extreme about things. I'm just saying that and it'll make things simple, easy. Khalas, recite the Fatiha, go ahead with it. But what I was trying to point out was when culture and tradition become so serious that subhanAllah, simplicity of the deen turns into this complication. I've just given one simple example of culture and customs and traditions where the deen made it so easy. And when we prioritize things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make upon us, we become like the people before us, as the Christians and Jews did. They made rabbi, you know, rabbis and, and, and uh, priesthood, where a sect of them are not allowed to get married. Priests who cannot get married. We see the result today of what is happening to them. How can an imam give counseling to a married couple when he cannot get married? How? So, when we make, prioritize certain things before Allah and His Messenger, our hearts become hardened, our relationships become severed, our happiness goes away, our lives become complicated, and all of our actions which we did are like dust in the wind. I wish that we could have even earned something pleasurable out of it. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have benefited from this before you. And then I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you have benefited anything tonight, to genuinely, with a sincere intention, to pass it on to your families and to your friends and to other people. Today, I went to QTV, Qatar TV station. Wallahi, it was the best experience for me. I spoke on the camera directed at non-Muslims. I thought I was talking to Muslims. And I thought, subhanAllah, what's the purpose of, you know, I'm here and you've got, mashallah, lots of mashayikh and scholars and ulama and da'is. This is the land of the Arabic language. And today, subhanAllah, I realized that there are so many non-Muslims here. And so many Muslims who know English only, who don't know much about the deen. And I realized, is this so? Could it be that there is a great need for da'wah here in Qatar? Like there is a need in Australia? I realized this today, brothers and sisters in Islam. And I have to say, please, my brothers and sisters in Islam, from a brother, from my heart to your heart, intending well, insha'Allah, continue this work and improve it. Keep going more. But this cannot be done unless, first of all, your intentions are in the right place. When you do this, do it for Allah, really, really. When you recite Al-Fatiha every single rak'ah, in every single salat that you pray, you are making a contract with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again and again. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You Allah alone do we worship and you Allah alone do we seek the help from. Are you, do you really mean it? I'm asking you, do you really mean it? Do you really mean that only Allah you are worshipping? You know what that means? قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say He is Allah, the one and only that should be my objective. That's what it means. هُوَ Allah. Instead of all this, it's Allah that you should be making your objective. أَحَدْ Alone. One. Is it truly Allah that you are worshipping? Is it truly Allah that you are doing this work for? Is it truly the hereafter that you want to really see your work? I am Allah, I've seen many brothers and sisters here who are the backbone of this great work, the backbone. They don't want to be mentioned. They don't want to be known. They don't want their work to be, you know, on placards. Their names be, be, be engraved on placards. They don't care if they're in or out, so long as they're doing something. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Increase in that effort, my brothers and sisters in Islam, and make that your priority. Wherever you work, whatever you do. Enjoy your wealth, enjoy your work, enjoy your car, enjoy your family. But transform the intention. That is all that is between you and Jannah. A line, a thin line, which exists inside here. Transform the intention and make it sincere. Then the shaitan will have no room to enter and whisper in the fridge. Because he said, وَعِزَّتِكَ وَجَلَالِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ by your might and power, O Lord, 
I shall lead them all astray, except one type of people. And I end up with this type of people, inshaAllah. What did he say? Except your servants, not all of them, among them, minhum, from among the Muslims, minhum, al mukhlasi who are truly sincere in their actions, seeking your pleasure. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us among those who are sincere, whose actions will not be dust in the wind, even if our actions are a little bit, to accept our actions as if they are like a mountain. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our work. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make my brothers and sisters here in Qatar from among the most successful and to make your work among the most successful. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring happiness into your heart and satisfaction to your families, to make life easy for you and simple. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive my sins and yours, to give us mercy, to unite our hearts. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept my work and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us with the beautiful knowledge which he has given us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we meet again, if not in this world, in Jannah, in the hereafter. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to respond in favor of our dua. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه يا فوز المستغفرين هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته